on December 7, 1941, hundreds of Japanese planes came pouring into Hawaii, sinking over 20 American ships, disabling 300 American airplanes, and killing nearly 2,500 men. On December 8th, a day later, President Franklin D. Roosevelt declared war on Japan. Former President Herbert Hoover on that same day said publicly, the President took the only line of action open to any patriotic American. He will and must have the full support of the entire country. We only have one job to do now and that is to defeat Japan. Amongst his confidants though, the former President said, you and I know this continuous putting pins and rattlesnakes finally got the country bitten. It's common knowledge that Japan decided to attack America out of the blue, with no provocation and for no reason. But is that actually true? On July 26, 1941, four months before Pearl Harbor, President Roosevelt put economic sanctions on steel, scrap iron, aviation goods, oil, and gasoline exports. At the time, President Hoover criticized these sanctions, saying, Either we leave this thing alone or we will be drawn into real trouble. Herbert Hoover was correct. Real trouble was about to come. Even though Roosevelt announced US neutrality and many times said, your boys are not going to be sent into any foreign wars, he still continued to join Britain and the Netherlands in putting economic pressure on Japan. At the time, Hitler was abandoning the Berlin-Rome-Tokyo axis upon his attack against the USSR, leaving the Japanese to a possible attack from Stalin as well. Japan was also in a four-year war with China that seemed to have no end. The sanctions were hurting Japan even more, depriving them of American oil and food imports they desperately relied on. Japan's actions in China and the rest of East Asia were horrific, but they were logically left with just three options. One. They could invade the nations around them for food and oil, costing them much and perhaps gaining only little. Two, attack the United States to pressure them into relieving sanctions. Or three, make strategic peace with certain enemies. Option three was their decision. The Prime Minister of Japan at the time, Prince Fumiano Kioni, seeking to end current tensions with sanction-imposing countries, suggested a meeting with President Roosevelt. This potential meeting was proposed to American Secretary of State, Cordial Hull, by Ambassador Kishoburo Nomura, the Japanese ambassador of the United States. Per instructions from Tokyo, a letter was delivered during a meeting with President Roosevelt, which was the chance for the president to avoid conflict. Although the president presented the Japanese ambassador with a warning that he and Winston Churchill had drafted the Atlantic Charter Conference, saying that the US will take necessary steps against the Japanese government if they attack any more neighboring countries. But here is where American Ambassador Joseph C. Grew comes into play. Grew noticed that the US government had built up the idea that an attack from Japan would not happen due to the sanctions. He quickly refuted this claim, saying that the Japanese reluctantly would, with resolution, confront such a catastrophe rather than yield to pressure from a foreign country. Tokyo around this time would send numerous appeals to the United States. On September 3rd, the New York Times Herald Tribune had reported on Japan's Prime Minister requesting for a meeting. This report was most likely leaked by American officials as no one outside of the government knew about these interactions. Although the President's press secretary at the time denied a meeting with Japan ever being proposed. Press Secretary Stephen T. Early that the president had received no invitation from Japan. Despite this remark, the Japanese Prime Minister arranged a secret meeting with the American Ambassador on September 6th. Ambassador Gru noted that the Prime Minister agreed with the warnings of a potential war and felt that this meeting would resolve all of the issues at hand. And still, the United States government ignored Japan. Following this failure, the Prime Minister of Japan's cabinet fell apart and was replaced. On October 16th, the day after the government fell, American Ambassador Joseph C. Grew wrote, I knew that the failure of the progress in the American-Japanese conversations would almost certainly bring about Konoe's fall. Why on earth should we rush heading into war when Hitler is defeated, as he eventually will be, the Japanese problem will solve itself. At this point, the American Ambassador was certain that war was on the horizon. The Prime Minister's new cabinet was composed primarily of war hawks with one exception, Foreign Minister Togo, who would, by the Emperor's directive, take on war negotiations with the United States, with the United States to avoid disaster. Per instructions of Foreign Minister Togo, Japanese ambassadors gave Proposal A to American Secretary Hull and was urged to speak to the President immediately. Proposal A consisted of promises to end the war in China and any occupation of French Indochina. Secretary Hull rejected the proposal. Upon further instructions from Tokyo on November 20th, 
the Japanese ambassador presented a Proposal B. This proposal was a truce, declaring neither country would make any move. To discuss this truce, Hull later had a meeting with the ambassador of Britain, China, Australia, and the Netherlands. Out of this meeting would come a 10-point ultimatum written by the United States State Department. This memo would ignore both of Japan's proposals. Earlier in the month, before the ultimatum was written, Secretary of State Hull asked Chief of Staff General Marshall and Chief of Naval Operations Admiral Stark for advice on U.S. relations with Japan and China. Stark and Marshall wrote back, pleading that the U.S. would not enter a war unless absolutely necessary. They ended the memo by warning that no ultimatum be delivered to Japan. Chief of Staff General Marshall and Chief Naval Operations Admiral Stark were ignored. On November 25th, President Roosevelt held a meeting that included Secretary Hull, Admiral Stark, General Marshall, and Secretary Henry L. Stimson. Secretary Stimson wrote in his diary about the meeting, saying, FDR brought up the event that we are likely to be attacked perhaps next Monday, December 1st for the Japanese are notorious for making an attack without warning. And the question was what we should do. The question was how we should maneuver them into positions of firing the first shot without allowing too much damage to ourselves. On November 26th, the ultimatum was sent to Japan. President Roosevelt, after four months of silence, held a press conference on November 28th to discuss foreign relations with Japan and China. Upon being questioned by reporters, the president said that the Chinese situation is set in stone and that there would be no chance of compromise. None of the communications with Japan, the ultimatum, the Prime Minister of Japan's efforts to find peace were mentioned to the American people. By December 4th, naval communications in Washington received from two independent sources that Japan was soon to attack the US. By December 6th, the day before Pearl Harbor. And yet, on the same day, President Roosevelt wrote a telegram to the Emperor asking for peace. Secretary Hall commented in the drafting of the President's message that its sending will be of doubtful efficacy except for the purpose of making a record. And so the question is, why couldn't have the President broadcasted this to the world? Surely this might have had a chance at stopping the attack. In fact, couldn't he have mentioned any of these negotiations to the world, especially to the people of America? The Roosevelt administration promised the American people that there would be no war, and yet took every step necessary to enter the war through deception. The economic sanctions, the failure to negotiate with the Prime Minister of Japan, and the outright ignorance of the American ambassadors. This failure to be transparent with the world and to be open to the idea of peace led to the loss of thousands of American lives. On the 81st anniversary of Pearl Harbor, we are forced to compare what's happening today in Russia and Ukraine to what happened 81 years ago in Japan, China, and then Hawaii. Our elites are still meticulously meddling in foreign affairs of countries thousands of miles away, leading us ever more into a possible conflict. The American Empire's claws have been clamped into the world ever since the end of World War II, and they have not let go. America followed a tradition of non-intervention by George Washington and the Founding Fathers all the way up until World War II. We stayed at home, and yet, the New Deal regime shattered that reality. Many people refer to the shattering of this reality caused by Pearl Harbor as a surprise, but it was no surprise to Franklin D. Roosevelt and his administration. They knew it was coming, and they expected it. The American people did not long for conflict with Germany or Japan, but it's what they got, because it's what the elite wanted. And today, the American people tire of hearing about the war in Ukraine, sending billions in aid, and our elites ever marching us closer to intervention in that conflict. It's time for the American leaders to listen to the people for once, to stop their schemes, and to remember what war really costs. Lives, material, and most importantly, the future.